Hello. In this lecture, we're going to look at the use of qualitative methods to understand patients' experience of a devastating injury or disease or surgery as, as a result of those, how it affects their life. My name is Vaikuntan Rajaratnam. I'm a hand surgeon based in Singapore. The, most of this lecture will be given by Dr. Raman, who is a primary care physician and a tropical medicine specialist who is currently doing research uh, based on a qualitative methodology and she will ex share with you uh, two case examples of how qualitative research can help us in understanding the patient's concerns and expectations to help us deliver better care. When a patient experiences a devastating injury or surgery as a result of the injury or illness, they become impacted by the condition. This impact is not just merely physical or biological and we as surgeons tend to be preoccupied with the biological and physical impact. However, that condition has psychological, social and economic impact. Most of the measures that we use in surgery do not take into account these three aspects of the non-physical. So we're going to look at two research methodologies to understand the impact of devastating injuries on the patients, their families and community, specifically looking at their needs, their coping strategies and how they can best be supported. So the first would be using the qualitative research. This can be done in several ways, but we're using here phenomenology or lived experience of patients and the example would be uh, brachial plexus injuries. Uh, the next one would be transdisciplinary research approach not 100% qualitative because there is a small component of quantitative research, but mainly using qualitative. This is a holistic approach which combines knowledge from the scientists and the societal actors to address complex societal challenges as experienced by burns patients. This slide shows the demographics of the two patients and you can see they both suffered pen plexus, brachial plexus injury of their left upper limb. Both the patients underwent nerve transfer surgery. So how do you analyze the video interviews? The analysis will be done following the principles of thematic analysis. First of all, the video interviews will have to be transcribed verbatim. You have to familiarize yourself with the data. So it's important that you read the transcriptions repeatedly and analyze them line by line. Whilst watching the video, you have to watch the expressions and the body language very closely. It is essential that you double check your transcriptions against the video recordings to ensure that they were true to data. During the initial open coding phase, two authors will analyze the data independently to check in the interpretations, ensure consistency, and it lends reliability to the analysis. The codes are then discussed, following which they will be assigned to categories and the whole process repeated until there is consensus. The categories are then grouped into themes. So the analysis of the patient's video interview identified six categories, which were organized into five themes, and the surgeon's interview identified seven categories organized into six. This is just to give you an example. This is from the patient's video interview. You can see here that there are four columns. The first column is the raw data, also called the illustrations. They are the patient's transcribed responses. And when you read through the transcriptions, you must actively observe for meanings and patterns that appear in your data set. You can jot them down or you can create memos to remind yourself of potential codes that you like to create. So next, when you're more familiar with the data, you can then create a set of initial codes that represent those meanings and patterns that you saw in the data. You also create your code book to keep track of the codes that you have used. And as you read through the data again, you'll be able to identify interesting excerpts and then you apply those appropriate codes to them. Then you can group together all the codes with similar meanings into categories. And you can then see how these categories can be combined into themes or sub-themes. So it's almost like a um, filing cabinet where you keep your papers in a file, which is your code, 
Then you keep the files in your in a drawer, which is the category, and the the drawers are part of your filing cabinet. Okay. And we did the same for the surgeon's video interviews too. So in conclusion, the qualitative research uh, eliminates the experiences and interpretations of events by the actors by giving them a voice. So in this interview, the patients were allowed to reflect on what was said to them by the surgeons. And the video itself uh, was worth a thousand words as it showed their satisfaction with the outcome of the surgery despite the devastating nature of their injuries and their limited recovery. So for the surgeons, they realized that the experience of health, illness and medical interventions cannot always be measured and it is important to understand the outcomes from the patient's point of view. This is an introduction to transdisciplinary research approach, and it is based on the Burns paper by Brosa and colleagues. Brosa and colleagues in the Burns study used the dialogue model, which is grounded in a responsive research methodology. And this means that the issues of the stakeholders are the starting point for a dialogue to improve a certain way of practice. So who are the stakeholders? These are the people or the organization whose issues are at stake. Transdisciplinary research allows for mutual learning and reframing of the problems and co-creation of solutions, resulting in improvements of practice. All the stakeholders are actively involved in the process of design, data collection, and dissemination of results. Transdisciplinary research consists of six phases. The first phase is the exploratory phase, where the researchers carry out a desk review that is looking at policies or guidelines. They survey the interests. They have informal conversations with key informants, and they try to align the interests with relevant uh, stakeholders by holding informal talks. And they also uh, use the snowball approach to get more participants. So this will lead to them getting a helicopter view of the problems. They will be able to identify uh, evidence-based interventions and they will be able to do the stakeholder mapping. Uh, that is the recruitment of potential partners. So the second phase will be the consultation phase or the problem scoping phase. This is where the researchers will carry out in-depth interviews and focus group discussions to develop a comprehensive list of problems relevant to the perspectives of the different stakeholders. In the prioritization phase, the stakeholders will come together to prioritize and rank the problems and they will be reframing the problems related to, in this case, burns that will need further action to improve the lives of these individuals. So in the integration phase, the stakeholders will discuss this prioritized list to come to a consensus. Next is the programming, which is when the joint um, agenda will be discussed to determine the acceptability uh, of the intervention options. And then finally, we have the implementation where the research team will package the solutions as a pilot program and the program will be monitored and evaluated and the results disseminated to all stakeholders to see its potential scalability. So this slide shows the stakeholder mapping which is the relationship between stakeholders according to their power and interests. It is the ranking of stakeholders based on the needs and the, their relative importance uh, to the others in the network. It will help you to see how the interests of these stakeholders should be addressed as very often there will be uh, some form of imbalance of power. And it is frequently used during the preparatory phase of a project to assess the attitudes of the stakeholders regarding the potential changes. 
So in conclusion, the dialogue model proved to be useful in eliciting research priorities from both the professionals and the burns survivors, and in stimulating a meaningful dialogue between these groups. The involvement of the ban survivors uh, identified burns research areas that were currently not the focus of the research by the professionals.